Hey everyone, Chris here from Varsity Gaming. If you're looking to get into Siege, now is the time to do it, because today I'm going to teach you everything that you need to know before starting Siege. The game is growing every single day and is about to enter its fifth year of support with a six year confirmed. There is a lot to learn, so let's get into the basics. I won't be covering these topics in crazy depth as there is a lot to talk about, but I will give you the essentials. And majority of these topics that I'm going to be touching on have been the subject of previous Siege schools where I go crazy in depth. So if you want to learn a lot more information on top of what I'm already talking about, there's a link in the description down below to the playlist of Siege schools, so you can go watch that. But before I give you any information, just I want to say a big thanks to Ubisoft Canada for sponsoring this video and making it possible. But first off, the basics, and what better way to start than just the plain description of the game. Siege is a 5 vs 5 multiplayer first person shooter. There is an attacking team and a defending team. Defenders are going to defend an objective on different sites, and they're going to try to prevent the attackers from taking over. Meanwhile, the attackers are aiming to try to take over the objective. And then either the defenders or the attackers can win a round if they secure the objective, or if the entire enemy team is dead. And then one match is played out over multiple rounds where each side will get a chance at both attacking and defending. Before we get into the core concepts of how the game works, I'm going to give you guys some definitions for some terminology that you'll probably hear me use a decent amount throughout this video. The first one is soft walls or soft destruction. People will commonly refer to walls or types of destruction as soft, and what they mean by this is if you have a soft wall, it means something that can be broken by either gunfire, explosives, or generic breaching utility. And then once this wall is destroyed, you can either walk or see through it. That is soft destruction and soft walls. Now there's a second definition, hard walls or hard destruction, which means these are things that got reinforced with the two reinforcements that all defenders have. And anything that is reinforced can't be broken by conventional means. It has to be broken with hard breaching utility, which is only available on Thermite, Hibana, or Maverick, which are operators which we'll talk about later. But you can't destroy it with gunfire or grenades or anything like that. The next term is downed. When someone refers to another operator as downed, they mean that they're in the down but not out state. This is what happens when you take enough damage that depletes all of your health, but not enough to fully kill you. In this state, operators can't fight back and all they can do is either crawl around or sit still and bleed out slowly. And if an ally gets this operator, they can revive them. But if they don't, then eventually the operator will bleed out and die. When an operator is revived, he will be set to 20 HP. Next term is a rotate, or rotate hole. This is generally a hole made in a soft wall to allow players to move more freely instead of having to go through doorways, which can be pretty constricting. Next term is a vertical play. This is what people mean when they're either going to play from above or below the target. So they're either going to shoot through the floor or the roof and try to kill people from above or below. Next term you'll probably hear me say a lot is roaming. This is where a defender is outside of the objective and just kind of, well, roaming around the map. Their goal is to either waste time of the attackers or to kill them before they get to sight. And the inverse of that is anchoring, or anchors. This is a defender that's sitting on sight and is usually the last line of defense before the attackers get into sight. Next term is spawn peeking. This is something that a lot of people do in ranked especially, where they will hold an angle on one of the attacker's spawn locations and try to kill them as soon as they walk out of spawn. Then we have the term lit, which is generally used to mean that a player is hurt but not downed. And it's not to be confused with the term dumb lit, which is how you'll be after you lose 500 elo and ranked. And the last term, which is also a callout, is over there. This is by far the perfect callout in Rainbow Six Siege, and the one thing people can always say and everyone will know exactly what you mean. When you die, just always say over there and your teammates will just know where to look. And that's it for terminology, those are the main important terms that you need to know before playing the game. Now before I get into the details of how a round or a match overall will play out, I do need to fill you guys in on the different type of game modes that are in the game, as well as the different playlists, because that will affect how a round or a match is played out. So first we'll talk about the game modes. There are three different game modes in Siege. Bomb, Secure Area, and Hostage. We'll start with Bomb. Bomb is the competitive game mode. It is the staple for Pro League and ranked overall. It is what the entire game is balanced towards and is recommended you play it the most in order to learn the game at the highest level possible. But this is how it works. Defenders will have two objectives, an A-bomb and a B-bomb, and they'll be split between two different rooms, generally right next to each other. The goal for the attackers in this game mode is to get into the objective site, so the room where the bomb is, for either bomb and plant a diffuser, which is a little briefcase. The diffuser takes 4 seconds to plant in casual and newcomer playlists, but 7 seconds to plant in the unranked and ranked playlist. 
If the attackers do not plant the diffuser, or at least start planting the diffuser before the time hits zero, they will lose. Once the diffuser is successfully planted, the defenders then have to deactivate the diffuser, or else they'll lose. The next game mode is the secure area game mode, which is similar to a King of the Hill style type of game, where defenders will have an objective or a room that they have to hold, and the attackers want to be inside that room in order to take over the objective. If a defender and an attacker are both in the room at the same time, no progress will be made. However, if only an attacker is on, the bar will slowly start to grow. Once the bar is complete, the attackers win. The only way defenders win is either by killing all of the attackers or completely preventing them from getting inside the objective until time runs out. If the attacker is not inside of the objective when time runs out, they will lose. And the last game mode is hostage, which I feel like from the name you guys can probably assume what it is. It is the defenders have a hostage and the attackers need to escort the hostage out of there. So the defenders will have a room where the hostage is and the attackers have to get inside the room and grab the hostage and then make it to one of the flares located around the map. This game mode is a little different in that the objective can be killed by either side. Either defenders or attackers can shoot and kill the hostage. Meanwhile in bomb and secure area that is not possible. So this is the one game mode where you have to be a little more careful. And while you're escorting the hostage, you can only have your pistol out so you're a little more vulnerable. Now the one big tip that I can give you guys for this category is that if you are going to play ranked, or at least if you want to play siege at a higher level, go into your options, go to your matchmaking settings, and disable secure area and hostage. This way you will only ever get the bomb game type when you're playing casual, which I'll get more into in the next section. But it'll stop you from learning bad habits which can be formed in secure area and hostage as those are the much less competitive game modes. But that's it for the modes, now let's get into the playlists themselves. This dictates the rules that you'll use in the match. Now for playlists there are only four that you have to worry about. There is newcomer, quick match, also known as casual, unranked, and ranked. And here you can see on the screen a graph that quickly shows you the differences between each of these game modes. And I just want to note that unranked and ranked are identical in every single way except for that ranked has a public MMR system that you can see and check how it's affected by each match, while unranked has a hidden MMR similar to much casual matches. But the main things you want to know between these playlists is that, like I said earlier, secure area and hostage are only available in the casual slash quick match playlist. My general guide for you if you're starting to play this game is Newcomer is not necessarily the best idea to play in because from what I have heard, I can't say from actual experience since I haven't played it myself, but from what I have heard, it is very, very smurf heavy, which means that there are people playing there that are actually very high level players and they just make a new account so that they can shit on people in the Newcomer playlist. Your experience may vary, but that is what I have heard. So personally, I would highly recommend playing casual first to start off. And once you feel like you've gained enough knowledge of the operators and maps, then you can move on to unranked and then eventually ranked. The reason I recommend this is because quick match is available from level 0, unranked available from level 10, and then ranked is only available once you hit level 30. So it's a good progression system and will teach you the ways of the game. But for all the other differences between these playlists, just refer to this graph, it'll tell you everything you need to know. And if there's anything on that graph that you're confused about, like you're not sure what I mean by the time links, like 4 minutes, 3 minutes, and all that, don't worry, I'll explain it throughout this video, just sit tight. But now that we have the core concepts nailed down, let's get into how an average round or match will play out. At the start of every single round, you'll go through the same process. First, you get to choose either your spawn location if you're on attack, or the site that you'll defend on defense. Or if you're in casual, it'll just tell you what site you're going to defend. Then you move into the operator selection screen. Here you'll have a choice of a variety of operators that you have unlocked. And if you don't know what any of these operators do, don't worry, I explain it in this video. But so you choose your operator and then you can choose your loadout. For the most part, this is all preferential, but I'm not going to get into it for this video. You choose your guns, your loadout, and then you lock in. Once everyone has locked in, the round will start to load up. If someone hasn't chosen an operator, then it'll randomly assign them one operator from the pool of operators that they currently have unlocked. Once it's successfully loaded, we'll enter into the preparation phase. This is different on defense and attack. For defense, players will have full control of their operator. They'll be able to move around the map and put down what we call reinforcements. These are metal walls which prevent people from just exploding a wall with a grenade or a sledgehammer or something like that. Every defender gets two reinforcements for a total of 10 across the team. However, if someone does leave the game, that means you will be down two reinforcements. They need to be destroyed with very specific gadgets. Defenders can also put down things called barricades. These are wooden panels that block doorways and windows. 
These barricades can be broken by defenders or attackers with either gunshots or meleeing. If you melee it, it takes 3 hits to break. Defenders are also free to put down any of their gadgets in this prep phase. They have a total of 45 seconds to do so, and then at the end of the 45 seconds is when the attackers will spawn. But during these 45 seconds, the attackers aren't just looking at a black screen. They are actually able to control these little robotic drones that can move around the map and jump. You can use the drone to scout out the map and spot players and the objective itself so you know where you're attacking. It's basically 45 seconds of intel gathering. If your drone gets destroyed, then you'll have to watch either your teammates' drones, or if they're all destroyed, you'll just have to stare at your spawn screen until the 45 seconds is complete. During this 45 seconds as the attacker, if you feel that you are not going to spawn close to where the objective is, you are free to change your spawn location. So the 45 seconds are up, prep phase is over. Action phase now begins. Attackers will spawn in, and then they can start pushing towards the building. Depending on what playlist you're queued in, you'll have a different amount of time for this action phase. For newcomer, it's 4 minutes long, for casual, it's 3 minutes and 30 seconds, and then for ranked and unranked, it's 3 minutes long. During these 3 minutes, both sides are free to do whatever their hearts desire. Just remember that the end goal is for the attackers to take over the objective, whether it be planting a diffuser, securing the area, or escorting the hostage, and the defenders are looking to stop the attackers. So in a very general sense, it's more likely that defenders will be anchoring slash camping on site, and the attackers will be trying to push their way in. There's only three ways that a round can end. Number one is the attackers run out of time and don't secure the objective. And then number two is that the attackers have successfully taken the objective and the defenders have run out of time. And then there's a third option where all players on one side will die. If all the attackers die, the defenders win. If all the defenders die, the attackers win. This is only barring a few exceptions but we won't get into those. Now that the action phase is over, the round has ended. Now depending on which one of the three outcomes occurred that I had just mentioned, one of the teams will win a point. If all the attackers die, the defenders will get a point. If all the defenders die, the attacker will get a point. You guys get it. Now what happens next depends on what playlist you are playing. In casual slash quick match, you'll play the same side twice. So if you started on defense, you'll go defense a second time, and then you'll go attack twice. If you're in ranked or unranked, you'll do the same side three times, than the other side three times. And in ranked and unranked, if you do successfully defend an objective, in the next round you will not be able to defend that same objective. It'll force you to cycle to a different site. This way you can't just keep doing the exact same strong objective every single time. You do have to mix it up. As far as I'm aware, casual does not have this limitation. However, if the defenders don't win the site, they can reattempt it, or they can try a different site. Now the cycle will continue until one team has scored a certain amount of rounds won. For casual and newcomer, whatever team reaches three rounds won first is the overall winner. For ranked and unranked, it's a little different. Either you need four rounds won in order to completely win the match, or if the scoreline is three to three, meaning that both teams won even amount of rounds in the first six rounds, then it'll go into overtime. Then the first team to get to five rounds won will win the entire match. And overtime has a few little different rules. Once you hit overtime, whatever side you start on is random. Also, all sites that you successfully defended in regulation will now be reset and unlocked so you can defend them again. And in overtime, you don't switch sides the same way. In overtime, you just swap sides every single round. Instead of doing three rounds in a row on defense and then three rounds in a row on attack, you do one round on attack, one round on defense, one round on attack, or vice versa. And then once one team has finally won the match, the match will conclude. Everyone will gain or lose ELO depending on whether they won or lost and you'll also gain some renown, and XP for your levels. And then that's it, that's how a whole match of Rainbow Six Siege plays out. Now since we talked a lot about attacking and defending, I feel like it's time that we should probably talk about the actual operators that both attack and defend in Rainbow Six Siege. Moving on to the next segment of operators. There are currently 52 operators in the game with 26 attackers and 26 defenders. With Operation Void Edge coming out next season, that'll go up to 54 operators with 27 attackers and 27 defenders. I'll cover these two new operators that are coming out at the end of the segment in greater detail, but for the rest of the segment I'm going to cover all of the current existing operators in a very quick and brief manner. I'm not going to tell you which operators to unlock because I've already done a Siege School on that, so if you want to see which operators to unlock, go watch that Siege School. But here's some basic information you need to know before I get into the operator section. Every operator has a speed and an armor. The higher the armor, the lower the speed, and vice versa. Armor plays a role in how much damage you take from different sources, and speed obviously affects how fast you move. 
Operators have a primary gadget which is unique to themselves, and then they have secondary gadgets, which they have two options for from a pool of five, which I'll cover later. And then lastly, each operator can only be chosen once for each side, so you can't have five Jaegers on defense and four Thermites and a Hibana. Each operator is unique to the round. With that all said, let's get into the overview section. We are going to start with attackers. First off, we have Sledge. He has a sledgehammer which can break soft surfaces, such as non-reinforced walls and hatches and barricades. It can also be used to destroy defender gadgets with just one swing, and he can use his hammer a total of 25 times. Thatcher has EMPs that temporarily disable or destroy defender's electronic gadgets. Whether it's destroyed or disabled is kind of arbitrary and there's no real pattern for it. When the EMP explodes, it has a 5 meter effective radius. Ash has a grenade launcher which can basically destroy any type of soft destruction or gadgets, but it can be intercepted by anti-grenade gadgets. Thermite is a hard breacher, it can breach reinforced walls and hatches. It can also be used on soft surfaces, although I wouldn't recommend it. Twitch has a specialized drone with a taser attached to it which can either damage defenders or destroy gadgets. This drone cannot jump like the default drones everyone else has. Montagna, or commonly known as Monty, has a full body shield that absorbs bullets and explosives. For explosives, Monty can only protect himself as if there's an explosive in front of him, it will damage anyone behind him. Glaz has a sniper with a thermal scope. The more he moves, the less effective it is. So staying still and holding angles is key for him. Fuse has cluster charges, which he puts on a surface and when detonated, sends out five explosive pucks into whatever room it's facing. These charges can be placed on any soft destruction surface. Blitz has a half-body shield with a blinding flash on the front. He can sprint with the shield up, but his legs won't be covered. And he can completely blind anyone within a certain range. IQ can pull out a scanner to detect all Defender electronic gadgets. The gadget itself won't tell you what you're looking at, but just that something is there. She can only use her gadget with her pistol out. Buck has an underbarrel shotgun with 21 shots that can be used to break any soft surface such as floors, walls, hatches, and barricades. Blackbeard has a gun-mounted bulletproof shield that can absorb about 2 bullets, or it has a total of 60 HP per shield. It primarily protects his face when he's aiming down sight. Capitao has a crossbow with two different bolts. One is a fire bolt, which will deal damage and spread across an area, killing any defender in the range. And the other is a smoke bolt, which will immediately cloud the area with smoke. The bolts are affected by gravity, though. Hibana is another hard breacher. Similar to Thermite, she can break open reinforced surfaces. She's more effective on hatches than walls because she can open a whole hatch, but on a wall she can only make crouch or peak holes. For Hibana, she only needs four of the six pelts to land on the hatch in order to break it. Jackal has a foot fetish and can track down defenders based on footprints. The more recent the footprints are, the more scans his gadget will have. Ying is similar to Fuse and has cluster charges with flashes. However, she can also throw them like a grenade into a room. They'll blind anyone who looks at them or is within a certain proximity. Everyone will get flashed except for Ying. She is always immune to her own cluster flashes. And when she's throwing it into a room, the longer she holds it, the shorter the fuse time is. Sophia has a double barrel grenade launcher. She has two impact grenades similar to the Defender gadget, which can break soft surfaces or gadgets overall. And then the other one is a concussion mine, which when sent out will immediately detonate if a Defender is within a certain range of it. This concussion will affect everyone and will make them aim slower and have distorted vision. Dokubi can call all defenders on the map at any time. Their phones will ring for 12 seconds, which allows attackers to locate them based on sound. And then if a defender dies at any point, not just when being called, they will drop a phone which Dokubi can hack. And when it's hacked, all the attackers will be able to see all of the defenders' intel-based gadgets, so drones, cameras, yokais, all of that. Lion can scan the entire map and ping any defenders who move during the scan. Once the defender moves, they'll be scanned three times in rapid succession. Finca has an adrenaline surge which will boost her entire team across the map. Her gadget has so many perks, it will give all attackers 20 bonus health, not a heal, but it will be like armor, on top of their current health. It will also reduce all recoil, make them aim down sight faster, reduce the effect that barbed wire has on them, revive any downed teammates to 5 health, reduces effects of concussions or flashes, and decreases your reload time. Maverick is another hard breacher with a blowtorch. He can make holes or lines in any surface that is reinforced or soft, and nothing can counter him, he can break any surface no matter what. Nomad can set up traps which will knock back any defender that walks within its range. When the defenders knock back, they're unable to do anything at all until they've stood back up. They'll also get knocked through soft surfaces if there's anything in their way. The trap will emit a small beeping noise when it's placed. Gridlock can lay down track stingers which are basically spike traps that hurt defenders as they walk over them. They can be destroyed with a single bullet or an explosive. Each of the track's canisters will deploy 19 individual tracks if there's enough room. Not can activate her gadget so she can no longer be seen on defender cameras, and also makes little to no noise when walking. If she sprints, she'll appear glitchy on cameras, and her noise suppression will no longer work. The gadget has a duration of 12 seconds and a 12 second refresh time as well. 
Amaru can use her grappling hook to grapple to any window, hatch, or ledge. She has roughly a 1 second animation time when she lands, so it's not recommended to use it as any sort of rushing tool. There's also a cooldown between each grapple. Kali is the last attacker introduced in year 4, and she has a bolt action sniper rifle with a 4x and 12x scope. She also has an underbarrel launcher which can destroy gadgets, similar to how Ash and Thatcher do, on either side of a reinforced wall. Her sniper will also one-shot down you if it hits you anywhere in the torso, and will do significant damage if it hits any of your appendages. That's it for the attackers, we'll talk about the new attacker after we talk about all the defenders. Moving on to defenders, we have the first operator, Smoke. He has gas canisters which he can throw and then detonate. These canisters will erupt and cover an area for 10 seconds damaging all attackers and defenders except for Smoke. Mew can place jammers which will jam any drones or attacker gadgets that operate within the area. It'll even counter Dokubi calls and line scans. The jammers are only effective if within the range, and you can see the icon in the bottom left corner if you are within that range. But only defenders can see this. Castle can place down upgraded barricades which are bulletproof or take 12 melee hits to break, as opposed to 3 for normal barricades. Or they must be destroyed with explosives. Pulse is a cardiac scanner which can track any attacker within its effective range, and it'll detect them through walls and floors, and the gadget has an infinite use. But you can't do anything else while the gadget's out. Doc has a stim pistol which he can use to either heal or pick up fallen defenders. When used to heal, it'll heal 40 HP. However, if you use it to pick up a fallen operator, it'll restore them to 75 HP instead of the normal 20. And Doc can use it on himself when he gets down in order to revive himself. Rook can place on an armor bag. When a defender picks up the armor, it'll reduce the amount of damage that defenders can take from attackers. It also guarantees that a defender will always get downed instead of killed when not shot in the head. Capcan is a trap-based operator and can put traps in doorways and windows. When an attacker moves through a window or door, the trap will explode dealing significant damage. Tachanka can place down a turret with a bulletproof shield on the front. He is useless and without a doubt the worst operator in the game. Do not use him. Bandit has car batteries that can be connected to any reinforcement or deployable shield or barbed wire. This will destroy any attack or gadget that comes into contact with the electrified surface. Jaeger can place down anti-grenade devices that will intercept any grenade within a certain range. Each ADS, which is what the gadget is called, can intercept a total of two grenades. However, they will not intercept Capital bolts. Frost is another trap-based operator who can put down bear traps on any flat surface. Any attacker who steps on this trap will immediately get downed. The attacker can then be revived and be set to 20 HP. These traps can be destroyed with two bullets each. Valkyrie has throwable cameras that can be placed anywhere inside or outside the map. These cameras can be accessed by any defender and have a huge range of vision. Caviera has a toggleable ability which will reduce all noise she makes by 75% regardless of what she does. However, when she activates this ability, she can only use her pistol. Her pistol will also always guarantee a down, unless the attacker is repelling. If an attacker is down, she can walk up to them and use her special ability to interrogate them, which will then reveal all of the attacker's operators and positions in real time for all the defenders to see. This information will last a few seconds. Echo has drones that can move around along the floor or can jump up to the ceiling and then cloak themselves. They can be used to disorient attackers or stop them from planting the diffuser. They have infinite amount of bursts that they can use, however there is a time to recharge. Mirror can place one-way viewing mirrors on any wall, whether it's reinforced or not reinforced. The glass can be broken by breaking the red canister on the back, either by defenders or attackers. However, it cannot be destroyed with bullets and can only be destroyed by explosives if it's placed on a soft surface. Legion is a trap-based operator who just recently got his nerf announced, so I'm going to tell you what his kit will be like after the nerf as opposed to how it is right now when this video comes out. He has little invisible goo mines that he can place across the map, and if an attacker runs through a goo mine, it'll detonate it. It causes the attacker to not be able to sprint, they can't plant a diffuser, and they'll also take 6 damage every tick. And the only way they can prevent all this from happening is by stopping and taking out the goo from their leg. Whenever an attacker runs through a goo, he will get points on the side of his screen, but he won't know which goo was detonated unless he hears it or sees it. Ella is, yet again, another trap-based operator. She has three proximity-activated devices, which will trip when any attacker walks within range. It has the exact same effects as Zofia's concussion mines. Vigil has a toggleable ability that will make him invisible to attacker drones and cameras if they have hacked them. A white bar effect will overlay on the screen if he's nearby the cameras, though so attackers can know that he is somewhere within the vicinity. His ability can last for 12 seconds. Alibi has holograms that she can place on any flat surface. If an attacker interacts with a hologram in any way, whether shooting, having a drone go through it, or them walking through it, it'll ping them 5 times in rapid succession. It'll also identify which operator they are. The holograms will always have Alibi's default uniform and be standing. Another small ability of hers is that if any defender runs outside the map, their identity will be concealed when normally you can see which operator it is. 
Maestro has two bulletproof turrets that he can place on any wall or floor. When these turrets get disabled, the front will open up and they can be shot and easily destroyed. But when they're not disabled, they can be used to hurt attackers or destroy gadgets. The turrets can shoot 20 times in a row without stopping before they need a cooldown. Clash has a bulletproof slash explosive resistance shield in front of her that can shock and slow attackers from a range. The shield has infinite use but will require some cooldown if it's used too much in rapid succession. Kade has electric claws that can be thrown and will electrify any reinforced surfaces, barbed wire, or shields within its radius. The electricity will destroy any attack or gadget that comes into contact with it and hurt attackers. Mozzie has pests that he can deploy, and when a drone drives nearby, it'll be taken over and Mozzie has control of it. He can then drive the drone around the map and use it to mark attackers. Warden has a toggleable ability that allows him to be completely resistant to flashes and see through smoke if he's not moving too much. However, the more he moves, the less effective the thermal vision is. Goyo can place down slightly customized shields. They are the same as normal deployable shields except for they have a gas canister on the back, and when that gas canister is shot, the shield will explode and fire will spread everywhere. If you're standing right next to this shield, when it explodes it'll deal 40-60 to 60 damage to you, and the fire will immediately burn you up. Wumai has magnets that he can throw anywhere and they will absorb any type of projectile from the attacking team. This includes Capital Bolts. Once it grabs an object, the magnet will pull the projectile towards it, detonate the projectile, and then self-destruct. It'll always reset the detonation timer though, so even a cooked grenade will be reset. He gets a new one every 42 seconds and can deploy a total of 5. And that is it for the defenders, now we're going to move on to the new Void Edge operators. First we'll talk about the new attacker, Yana. She has the ability to create a hologram that will be identical to herself and can do everything she can except for interact with the environment or any other player. That means it can sprint, vault, crouch, anything like that, it just can't shoot, ping, melee, or break barricades, stuff like that. It also has 1 HP, so as soon as anything hits it, whether it's from a friendly or from an enemy, it will be destroyed. And it has a very long cooldown when it's destroyed. But this hologram can be used for intel gathering. It can be used like a drone to go into sight, find out where they are, and then push in as soon as you get off of it. Also, the hologram that she deploys will have her exact same uniform. So it doesn't matter whether she changes her uniform or headgear, it'll always look just like her. And next up we have the defender Oryx, who has a much more simple ability. He can charge through soft destruction, whether it be barricades or walls. If he does go through a wall, he will take 10 damage every time he runs through one, and all of his charges will be reset, and he can hold a maximum of 3. These charges can also be used to just move around the map faster, as he is faster using his ability than when he sprints. And then he also has a secondary ability where he can jump through hatches. As long as the hatch is open and he looks up at it, he can either jump and hold on to it, creeping around, or he can jump and just immediately get up. So he is a very mobile defender. Now that we've covered all of the operators in the game and their primary gadgets, I think it's time that we talk about secondary gadgets. These are five defender and then five attacker gadgets that every operator will have access to at least two of them. Like I've said multiple times throughout this video, I do have Siege Schools specifically talking about these gadgets for both defense and attacking, but I'm going to quickly run through them now just like I did with the operators giving very quick and brief descriptions. It is important to note that this will not include the new attacker and defender secondary gadget that will be coming out in year 5, as these have not been fully implemented on the live build or even on test servers. So we will not be including them as they may change. But first running through the defender gadgets, we have the deployable shield. This is a bulletproof shield with small slits of bulletproof glass. It fits into a doorway and has to be vaulted over or destroyed in order to move through. It can only be destroyed with explosives. Next we have the bulletproof camera. This is a thermal camera that cannot be turned at all and can only see straight ahead. But it has a pane of bulletproof glass on the front, meaning that in order to destroy the camera it either has to be melee or hit with an explosive. Or it can be shot from the side. Another gadget is barbed wire. This slows the movements of attackers and their drones, but can be meleeed twice to destroy. It does not affect defenders at all. One of two explosives is impact grenades. These are grenades that make small holes into floors or walls, and they explode on impact. They can also deal a moderate amount of damage to an operator based off their armor and also how close it is, as they have very high damage drop-off. And then the last defender gadget and the second explosive is a nitrocell, or commonly known as a C4. It's a throwable explosive that does massive area damage, and it'll stick to floors and walls. Moving on to the attacker gadgets, first one we have is a claymore. This is a trap that activates when a defender trips one of the lasers. There are three pointing out in front of it, and if they touch any of them, it will detonate after about half a second. When it detonates, it will either kill or down the defender. Next attacker gadget is breaching charges. 
This is a soft destruction device and it can be used on walls, floors, or barricades. It's meant to open up areas in line of sight, but it can also be used to deal damage, although not recommended. The first of three grenades, we have flash grenades. These are grenades that blind and deafen operators in an area. However, they can be fairly inconsistent. Next, we have frag grenades, which are lethal grenades that can either kill or down someone in a close vicinity. And lastly, we have smoke grenades. These are grenades that cloud vision and can't be seen throughout all except for thermal scopes or cameras. They last for 10 seconds when deployed. That is it for the secondary gadgets for both attack and defense. Now we're going to move on to the next part of any operator's loadout is the attachments on the weapons. All guns will have options for some type of attachment, but not all attachments will be available on all guns. Again, I'm only going to be giving you guys the base information on how the attachments affect the gun itself. First, we'll start with the optical sights. For this, we have four or five, depending on whether you consider the vortex sight being different than the holographic. It isn't, but some people do consider it different. But these sights are the red dot sight, the reflex sight, holographic slash vortex sight, and then the ACOG. Red dot, reflex, and holographic are all one-time scope with no magnification. And they each have different pros and cons based on their housing and their dot. Meanwhile, ACOG is the only optical sight that has magnification, with a 2.5 times zoom. Moving on to barrel attachments, there are five. There is the flash hider, compensator, muzzle brake, extended barrel, and the suppressor. Now this information I'm about to share with you is taken from Rogue9's video on attachments. You can go watch that if you want to see more in depth about it. But he did say this information was directly from Ubisoft, so it should be 100% correct. There are a few terms you need to know before we get into the comparisons. First term is centering time. This is the amount of time it takes for the gun to go back to its original position. Reducing centering time means that it'll go back to the original starting point faster after you stop shooting. The next term is diamond. Each gun has a diamond around where you're aiming. This is an area where recoil can jump to. The smaller the diamond, the better your recoil will be. And last term is threat indicators. These are little semicircles with an arrow that pop up around your HUD when you're being shot at. When they're white, that means they were a missed but very close shot, and when it's red, it means that it did hit you. Now that we have those terms covered, let's get into the barrel attachments. First up, we have the flash hider. The flash hider reduces the recoil on your first shot by 37.5%, and reduces centering time by 30%, and then it overall reduces the diamond of your gun by 5%. For compensator, it only has one effect, and that is a smaller diamond by 7.75%. For muzzle brake, it has a reduction of 45% first shot recoil, and then for centering time, it also reduces it by 45%. The extended barrel has no effects on recoil, but instead improves long range damage by 15 to 20 percent however it's important to note that this does not mean it increases the damage if your gun has 35 damage it will not do more than 35 over a long range instead it will reduce the amount of damage that it drops off by so if your gun does 35 damage but only 20 at long range it'll increase the 20 so it's a little bit closer to the 35 and then the last attachment is the suppressor or the silencer this leaves no smoke trails and no threat indicators so it's hard to tell where the shots were from but it also reduces the damage produced by your gun by 15%. For the next type of attachment, we have grips. There's only two of them, and they're pretty straightforward. The first one is the vertical grip, which reduces your overall vertical recoil, but your gun takes just as long to aim down sight. And then there's the angled grip, which has the same recoil, but you aim down sight faster. So it's a preference between being able to aim down sight faster or shooting more accurately. And then the last type of attachment is the underbarrel. Currently, there's only one underbarrel, and it's the laser. This laser will reduce the hip fire spread when you're shooting, so overall will give you a tighter circle to shoot at. My overall general guide when it comes to attachments is that for sight, it's 100% preference based. For barrel, I'd recommend flash hider if you're going to be a little bit more close quarters combat and you're going to be spraying more, and then muzzle brake for small bursts from a long range. And then for grip, like I said, you're deciding between two factors, either vertical for recoil either vertical for recoil control or angled for aggressive plays, so you can aim down sight faster. And for the underbarrel laser, I personally only run them on shotguns, as shotguns you'll usually be hip firing anyways. There is one last attachment that you can modify for your loadout, and it is the charm. And really, there's only one charm you should run, the Varsity Gaming charm. And if you don't have it already, all you have to do is just subscribe to my Twitch channel with either Twitch Prime, which is free, or $5 per month, and you only have to sub once, and you'll get the charm forever. You can run it on all your guns, and it has a lot of pros and very little cons. Pros, it makes you amazing at the game. It makes you get an ace almost every single round. But there is the one con, is that it will get you too many girls. So just be warned about that. Moving on to the final category, we have maps. Yet again, I will touch on this very lightly because if I were to go in depth for all of the maps in the game, it would take 
forever. So I'm just going to give you an overview of the maps available in Siege. Every season the maps rotate and every single season there usually is at least one map rework or a new map added. Now they're focusing more on map reworks as opposed to adding new maps. And speaking of reworks, this season coming up with Operation Void Edge, Oregon will be the map that is getting reworked. This time it'll be a decent overhaul, it's not going to be a complete ground up rework, but it's not just a small buff either. The map is changing pretty decently. But this will change what maps are available in ranked as well as in casual. Overall, there are 20 total maps in the game, which in alphabetical order are Bank, Border, Chalet, Clubhouse, Coastline, Consulate, Favela, Fortress, Hereford Base, House, Café Dostoevsky, Canal, Oregon, Outback, Plain, Skyscraper, Theme Park, Tower, Villa, and Yacht. Now, out of these 20 maps, Casual will only have 14 of them, and three of them are being cycled out, and they tend to get cycled out every half season. For Operation Void Edge, Yacht, Canal, and Skyscraper are being replaced by House, Hereford, and Outback. Now for Ranked and Unranked, the map pool is a little smaller. They only include maps that are considered competitive. These maps for Operation Shifting Tides, as well as Operation Void Edge, are Bank, Border, Chalet, Clubhouse, Coastline, Consulate, Cafe, Canal, Oregon, Outback, Theme Park, and Villa. And then for Newcomer, the maps are Bank, Chalet, and Consulate. They have a much smaller map pool, so new players aren't overwhelmed. And what you need to know about these maps is that, like I said, for Ranked, they're much more competitive. The ones in Casual that you don't see in Ranked are generally a lot more fun-based. They're not balanced by any means, but they're meant to be more fun and engaging. Now for Ranked, every single map has four sites for the bomb game mode to ensure variety. But that's it for maps. Now to close out this episode, I'm going to go into the quiz section, which, if you haven't watched an episode like this before, basically I ask you guys a question, give you 10 seconds on the clock to come up with an answer, and then I give you my answer. If you think that your answer was close enough to mine, you get yourself a point. And at the very end, I'll give you a scorecard that shows how well you did based on how many questions you got right. Now let's get into the first question. Question 1. How are the winners of the round determined when the last two players trade? I.e. they kill each other at the exact same time. With 10 seconds on the clock, go. Time's up, and the answer is, for the bomb game mode, if the diffuser is planted, and the timer is going, then the attackers will win, when both of the last players kill each other. But if it's not planted, then the defenders will win. For secure area and hostage, the defenders will win no matter what, because the only way the attackers can win is either killing all of the defenders, and still having someone left alive, or securing the objective, which they can't do when they die. Question 2. How many Hibana pellets are needed to be on a hatch for it to be destroyed? Keep in mind that each set of Hibana X Kairos contains 6 pellets. With 10 seconds on the clock, go. Time's up. And the answer is 4. It used to be only 1 pellet was needed, but they changed it to be more consistent. And that way you actually had to land the row of pellets on the hatch in order to break it. And the final question, we're not going to have a bonus question today, but the final question, question three, do you run faster when you have a pistol out? With 10 seconds on the clock, go. Time's up. And the answer is yes. It's very marginal, but there is a difference between how fast you run with a gun out as opposed to a pistol. Now that's it for the quiz section. Here's a scorecard to show you how well you did based on how many questions you got right. Let me know in the comments down below how many you got right. Now normally here at the end of the video is where I just plug, plug, plug all of my stuff, but today I won't do that. The only thing I'm going to plug is to just let you guys know that we do sell merch. There's a link down below in the description. We have a bunch of different designs and merch for you to choose from. But other than that, I am done here. Again, thank you to Ubisoft for sponsoring this video. I hope you guys learned something new. If you do have more questions about other things that maybe I just didn't explain well enough, ask a question down below in the comments. Chances are that even if I don't answer it, someone out there will. I will try to go through and answer as many questions as I can, although if I miss yours, I'm sorry. But that's it for this episode. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care.